diversity within the classroom and the school system. Uh, Velma is a teacher herself, so I don't know where she finds time to do all these other things, uh, but she's also written an online course for the Toronto District School Board entitled Successful Teaching in a Culturally Mosaic Classroom. And so through her positions in both the provincial government and her work in education, uh, she's ensured that the voices of marginalized communities are reflected in policies and government communications. She's also helped strengthen collaborative ties between racialized communities, youth and government in new and innovative ways. And as chair of Operation Black Vote Canada, she is the architect of the first ever Black Community Provincial Leaders Debate, which I was a proud participant. Yeah. Um, Kathleen Wynn, Andrea Horwath and I uh, participated. Unfortunately, there was uh, one provincial leader who did not participate in that vote, but it was an amazing debate and very well done. Uh, and she's also um, helped organize the Black Women's Political Summit and the Next Generation Political Summit. Uh, and I can't even name all of the community associations that she's a part of. So I'm going to spare you other than to say mm -hmm. that uh, this is one incredible woman <laughs> who is just has her fingers all over the place. And, um, and to top it all off, uh, and Velma has made it very clear to me that she's nonpartisan in her role, but she was very gracious enough uh, to come and speak at the Green Party of Ontario's annual convention uh, this past fall. Um, and, um, and she's uh, and did a fantastic job in, in that role. But she always reminds me I'm nonpartisan, Mike. And, and so I, I definitely appreciate that. And so I just want to close Velma by saying that you're truly a dedicated and accomplished community leader. And I'm so thankful that um, you organized the provincial leaders debate in 2018 and that you invited the Green Party to participate. And I just really want to thank you for joining us tonight because I know you're an incredibly busy person. And so I just want to just take a moment to ask you like, how you're doing right now with this whole COVID pandemic? Like, how are you managing? Right. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I've just been trying to keep busy, um, I, continuing to work as a teacher and continuing to uh, uh, do some work for Operation Black Bull Canada. We've had to um, change focus and pivot a bit. Um, so we've been having uh, Zoom workshops mm -hmm. with uh, different cabinet ministers and city councillors at all three levels of government just to provide our community with direct information on all the resources that are out there for them. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of leaders like yourself, so much more is being asked of you right now uh, mm -hmm. with the pandemic. And then also just with the Black Lives Matter movement and the whole issues that uh, bubbled up around how do we address uh, systemic anti-Black racism. And um, I'm just wondering if maybe just like, you know, how are you holding up as a le community leader with all those additional pressures plus the pandemic? Right, I you know, so I think those, pr those pressures were there. It did bubble up um, because of the anti-Black racism um, down South and also in Canada. Um, people are asking for more information. People want to know uh, exactly what they need to do to change. And as I said, you know, it's not a, you know, add water and mix and then voila, it's right. done. There's, there's a lot of work that needs to be put into it. Um, these issues are not new. Uh, these issues mm -hmm. were always been there. And as a black person, I've always known that these issues were there and I had to deal with these issues. I think everybody else around is just shocked at the extent of the issues because they've seen it. Um, mm -hmm. They've seen a man die live on TV. So I think now people are saying, okay, we need, to, we need to make some changes and they want to know how to make those changes. And I'm saying it's not gonna be done overnight. Yeah, well, I keep thinking that, you know, anti-black racism in North America has been a 400 plus yes. year project, really. Yes. We're not gonna solve it overnight. No. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it takes a long time to undo centuries of racism. Yes. Uh, but it, it's it's vital and essential work. And I, I remember at the um, Operation Black Vote leaders debate, um, I acknowledged in my introduction that as a white man, you know, my position of privilege, 
Yes. Uh, and Steve Pakin tweeted that out and it blew up yeah, on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Like it was I, unbelievable. Like, people were saying to me, like, how come you hate yourself? And I go, I don't hate myself. Yeah, <laughs> like we yeah. just have to, you know, acknowledge the truth. And yes. and I partly ask that because I think now is an important time that um, people in a position of privilege like myself, like I think it's important for us to be allies to amplify that black voices. And just maybe just some thoughts on, you know, how anybody um, whose privilege can help be an ally and amplify uh, Black and Indigenous voices. Right, right, right. So I think, you know, I'm getting some feedback. I think in terms of being an ally, I think you need to look around your surroundings, um, where, you're, where you work, where you play, and look to see who's there. Look to see who's missing and uh, look to see what the policies are. If, you know, if you're around a group in your in your work environment and it's only white people you got to ask yourself why um there must be qualified black and indigenous people that could actually do the job as well so why is it that there are no black people or indigenous people there um i think being an ally is speaking up um even when we're not there yes. you know uh, speaking Absolutely. up even when we're not there um and it's also speaking up to, uh, to family members i'm quite sure that people have family members who say things and do things and we just pass this and oh that's just uncle whatever but no 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 it's not just uncle whatever uncle whatever lives in, in our society and he's saying it to you and he's saying it to other people and i think we, you need to call it out all the time not just when it's convenient or comfortable yeah it's a really good point and i'm just thinking something i have a i'm a parent i have two daughters and to not call that out, especially at family gatherings in front of your children, yeah. um, what the, the impression that leaves on them in terms of how they grow up. So I think it's yeah. really an you know, excellent point for sure. I'm just wondering, um, you alluded to this a little bit in the opening, but Operation Black Vote, um, some of the viewers tonight may not uh, know much about uh, Operation Black Vote. So maybe just explain a Tell us a little bit about it, what it does, how it started. Right. So Operation Black Bowl started in 2004. We are a multi-partisan, not-for-profit volunteer organization. Um, a lot of people think that this is actually all our real jobs because we devote so much time to it, but it's, it's a volunteer organization. Um, we support the election of more Black people to, um, to political office at all three levels of government. Um, the appointments to... Um, Black people to agencies, boards, and commissions at all three levels, and the appointment to senior uh, senior staff. Um, we understand that you know it's it's great to have a a black politician or a black cabinet minister, but it's also equally important to have black staffers who advise ministers on issues um, at the senior level table. Um, so that's what we work on. Uh, we also work on identifying and um, publicizing. Uh, black politicians across the country um, and the work that they're doing. So we're amplifying their, their voices. Um, we really do believe that representation matters. Um, you can't be what you, what you don't see. And so we're hoping that, um, you know, with, with the work and, and the publicity that we give the current elected officials, that more people would run for political office, that more young people would want to be political staffers and um, work for government. Yeah, I mean, thank you for just uh, highlighting the importance of political staff. So I think oftentimes people look at the elected politicians, but I can tell you, uh, my staff do a huge amount of work and really help guide the work I do in terms of how I'm going to vote or how I speak on issues. Right. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's really important yeah. that uh, we understand the importance of diversity within staff as well as elected yes, politicians. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was a, a former political staffer and I know that, you know, for any minister that I work for, you know, there was a diverse diversity of opinion. So on any particular issue, um, you know, the minister can say, say, okay, what do you think about this issue? And because we had a diverse uh, staff, there are so many different issues and, was, and, and the conversation was richer and the policies were also better because we were basically tapping into the diversity that is Ontario. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I think, you know, one nice thing about the current Ontario legislature, while we have a ways to go, it's certainly more diverse now than it has been probably in Ontario's history. And I, I you know, I just, I, I think of like, you know, people like MPP Laura May Lindo or oh, yeah. MPP Mitzi Hunter to be, yeah. you know, bipartisan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Both great, uh, both great people. Both great people. And I, and, and there's others as well, yeah. but I just, 
both of them spoke in the house today. So I, I'm yeah. thinking of what they had to say today. Yeah. And having those voices in the legislature are, are just vital. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's key because it brings um, a different type of lived experience that you would not even imagine if you didn't have those voices there. And I'm yeah. not saying that, you know, our community, our community is not monolithic, but at least mm. it's a different perspective. Yeah, it's a good point, too, because I, I know in, in my community right now, um, we had a very large Black Lives Matter uh, march. Yeah. And now there's a lot of meetings uh, with the chief of police. And the one thing he's, he said to me was like, oh, my gosh, the number of the diversity of Black voices in yes. our community. I want to get insights. And people like, every community is diverse. And every community has a lot of different political perspectives that are brought to the table. Yeah. yeah, I want to ask you about your 1834 fellowship initiative oh, yes. and just just what that's all about. And yeah, that's that's is one of um, I love that project. I'm so excited about that project. So the 1834 fellowship is a two year program where we are going to have uh, 40 um, high potential youth, 18 to 24, and we put them through a year training and mentorship of public policy. Uh, we know that there is, uh, we don't have enough black public policy folks in, in government, across government, uh, all three levels of government, all three levels. So our, our hope is that, you know, we're going to be training, um, educating the next generation of political policymakers. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, oh, I was going to say. I'd love to recruit some to the Green Party. I know you have to be nonpartisan, <laughs> but you want to infiltrate every party, right? <laughs> so I, yes, yes, we do. We, we do. Um, um, you could go onto our, our website and you could read their bios. I, I joke that you know, if I was between eighteen and thirty-four, I probably wouldn't get into the program. Um, they're they're so good um, in terms of their education, in terms of their volunteer work, in terms of their commitment to the community and the things that they've accomplished so far, um, despite their their backgrounds. And I think that, you know, once this program is done, I think a lot of people are going to grab them up because they're just that good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm yeah, I believe it. Yeah. I, I think one of the, um, I think important moments of speaking with you in particular, Velma, given the experience you've had as a high level political staffer, but also just all the community organizing and volunteer work you've done, um, your perspective on just, how we seize this moment um, and translate that into political policy change. Like you're probably as well positioned to talk about that as anyone I know. Yeah, so I think, and I've said this, you know, so many times, we need to take an internal audit. Every institution needs to take an internal audit and look um, at, to see who's at the table, who's missing from the table, look at their policies. Uh, what is their policy missing? Um, does their policy speak to and represent um, the adversity that is within Canada. And if it doesn't, then you need to make concrete change. Um, the work is not easy. The work is going to be uncomfortable. Um, there will be people who might feel as if, you know, they're being picked on or, you know, what they, their belief system is being poked at. Uh, but I think the only way to, to, to bring about real change is actually change things that are happening right now to change policies. Um, look at policy through an anti-black racism uh, lens. Um, and it's gonna take a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. You just, you just, you just gotta put, put the work in. And, and I always say, you know, people think just by bringing in a black person, you know, okay, we've solved anti-black racism. No, yeah. what is the environment like? You know, because, you know, I could be in an, an environment and not at the decision making table Then that be microaggression. It might be an environment that that doesn't um, that doesn't nurture me. Um, it might be an environment that makes me ill. Um, so also not only look at the policy, but look at the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what are some of the policy changes that you would like to move to kind of the macro public policy angle? What are some public policy changes you would like to see? It, we'll keep it to Ontario, it, it, like from the provincial government. So this is the thing, because I'm here on behalf of Operation Black Boat, I won't do any policy questions. Okay, no worries, <laughs> no worries. No, I don't want to get because, too then I, then, I, then I become partisan. But I do, okay. but, you know, we could talk offline because I do have ideas. <laughs> no, I'd love to talk with you offline about that. But no, you, I understand you, you've got to speak with your, with your um, organization hat yeah. on. Absolutely. 
So I will then shift to um, how do parties like the Green Party yeah. and all political parties, all political parties, yeah. How, how do we um, recruit more diverse candidates, particularly Black candidates, but I would say Indigenous candidates, people of color. Yeah. Um, you know, how do we how do we make sure that you know we we have a diverse movement? Right. So I think it goes back to that policy question, right? So um, the Green Party is known for certain types of policy. Um, the Green Party has a reputation, has an image, and it doesn't. Uh, I mean, it doesn't speak to racialized people. Mm -hmm. um, so your policy, your green policy, which is interest, which is your climate change policies, um, we know that you know that those type of things are going to hit the black community first and worse. Yeah. However, it's never been articulated by the Green Party in that way, yeah. um, right? Your policy doesn't speak to, to me or anybody that looks like me. So how do you change um, the policy or communication of that policy to say, you know, we're taking you, when we're creating this policy, we're taking you into consideration. We're taking your lived experience into, community, into, um, into consideration. You know, um, there are some of the policies that you have that, you know, some people just can't afford. How right. do you make your you know, those policies or solutions to those um, to those issues affordable to the single mom taking the streetcar or bus to work every day? Yeah. Um, no, so yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So, th yeah, so those are some things that I think, you know, if you want to attract more people, uh, more black people, racialized people, um, indigenous people to your party, then you have to start speaking their language. Um, you have to start um, meeting them where they're at and making your policies, you know, palatable for, for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that, as you mentioned, is social justice policy, but I also think you're absolutely right. I mean, environmental racism, for example, is an issue uh, that we could be talking about, or just how climate change disproportionately affects people who are, um, you know, more marginalized, yes. either economically or the neighborhoods they live in, et cetera. Yes, exactly. exactly. And so are there ways that we could talk about environmental racism in particular in ways that um, is engages people of color more? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is to talk about it. Yep. <laughs> I, have, I mean, I haven't heard it talked about widely, so talk about it. And, and how does it relate to those people? And then... Um, not only does it relate, but what are some solutions that, you know, that are you calling for the government to do, but it has to be solutions that is attainable by, by everybody in our community. So, you know, we have an array of people in our community. We have people who are wealthy, people who are middle class, people who are, you know, who are living in underserved communities. How is your policy going to reach the spectrum of black, of the black community or mm -hmm. the, or in, in, indigenous community? And where are you like where are you where are you communicating this this policy to right. and how right so if you're not communicated it in a venue or in a media where you know where black people or indigenous people are then it's all for naught right? right so um it's not you have to go outside your circle outside your bubble and find you know fish where you know you got to fish where there are fishes mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so that's what you're going to have to do yeah no it's a very good point and uh, I'm wondering, um, I know Operation Black Vote, as you're thinking about um, having more parties have more candidates from the Black community, yes. uh, what are potential candidates, like what are they looking for? Are there supports parties can provide? Are there ways in which parties can engage uh, potential Black candidates in a way that you know, uh, encourages them to run and makes them feel comfortable running. Right. So often we've um, we do a municipal boot camp um, for um, for candidates who are going to be running municipal, and we've done a nomination workshop with all parties. Um, they're all there are federal parties, though, but we've done it with all parties and how to get the nomination. And the one thing we we hear is that you know a lot of times they don't know how to access. So it's mm -hmm. the information. Um, and if you go online to almost any of the political parties, and if I was going to run, like, how would I know where to, like, I go on the site, I don't know where to, how, where do I start? So they don't even know, they don't even have the entry point in, in how to run, especially if it's provincial or federal, where they need to get the party nomination. Again, there's no information on how to get the party nomination and the process to, um, to, to, to running. So 
I think parties need to make that that kind of information and the way to run more transparent. Um, they need to probably do like, this is what you need to do if you're going to run in the next election. You know, you need to be part of a, um, a right. writing association. You need to do, you know, so there's a checklist of things to do. You know, often the people who, um, who run come from families that have a political history or, you know, they volunteered on a campaign either through university so they understand how to get into um, politics. But there's members from our community who don't, who, who are not on, you know, um, a campus a, a campus um, party, or they they're, they don't have a history in politics with their family in Canada, so they wouldn't even know the entry point. So I think the first thing is, what is the entry point? What are the things that I need to do to run for your particular party? Um, and so those were the two things that we got when we had our, our workshop on how to get the nomination. And do you think it's important for parties to go out and actively recruit? Because one of the things That's I right. find is when you say, "Hey, nominations are open." A bunch of white men come forward and put their, uh, you know, put their name forward. But oftentimes women don't, right. and uh, people of color oftentimes don't yes. as well. Yes. So I think it's incumbent to, I guess, put some extra work in as well, eh? Yes. So um, there was a study that said that you have to ask a woman seven times before she decides to run. Um, whereas a man, you have to just start the sentence, and he has his hand up. He's like, "I'm ready." Um, right. For you know, black for the people, the black community, indigenous people, it's probably more than seven times. But you also do need to go and ask them. Um, yeah. I think you know we do a very good job at recruiting uh, women now because we've had that study and we've had organizations that says it's important to have women and you need to sign a contract or a pledge that you have fifty percent women. Um, right. So so parties have gone out to ensure that there is a balance of women and they've actively had to do that. I think if you want indigenous people and black people then you actively have to go out and seek um, and seek us. Yeah. And I, and I would say in the case of the Green Party, I think you're absolutely right. We have to go outside of our bubble because I find the environmental movement in general is very white mm -hmm. uh, in Canada, especially. And so I think going outside of that traditional movement, but I also think it's incumbent upon the environmental movement you know, big, which is bigger than the Green Party, yes, obviously, yeah. to figure out ways to become more diverse as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think in, in becoming, I mean, not only more diverse in people, but in policies, mm -hmm. um, and in just and, and just in their environments. You know, I mean, if I, it's almost, I had this saying that I love, and I and I used it at the Green Party convention. You know, diversity is inviting me to the dance, and inclusion is allowing me to dance. Um, you know, so, you know, when you invite people to your party or to your house or to your company organization, you have to allow them to be able to dance and be themselves and acknowledge that, you know, that what they contribute is beneficial to the, to the, to the whole picture of what you're trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I know the next provincial election is only two years away. Trust me, I'm, I'm almost counting down the days <laughs> So I'm wondering what Operation Black Vote, like, do you, are you starting to plan for the next provincial election and what role you're going to play as an organization? Well, so we, so we did start to plan and then COVID happened. So we had to pivot, um, but we are going to be planning. We're going to be doing more workshops on um, how to get the nomination. And we're going to be asking people to put their hands up and, you know, try if you, if, if they so please identify which party they would likely would like to um to run for and then we would reach out to those parties and say you know we have you know three or four people who want to run for your party you know um check them out <laughs> you know um we i can't vouch for them but they put their hand up they want to run so you could do your due diligence but you can't say that you know you didn't have anybody um but i also think you know we're going to be doing our part but i think each party needs to also do their part and yeah. go out and um and recruit yeah, and, and I'm, I, I was wondering, you, you know, you, I asked you earlier a bit about policy. So does Operation Black Vote, do you not touch policy at all? And it's mostly about um, like candidate, staff, recruitment, education, et cetera? Um, so we try not to touch policy, but there are times that, you know, if it's, if it's glaring and it has to do with um, the politics, mm -hmm. we will. But we try not to because we're, we're supposed to be multipartisan. We're right. not supposed to be, we are multipartisan. Um, but there are some, I mean, 
in the past year, we've had to speak out on certain things because it transcended uh, multi-partisanism. So we had to say something, but we try not to get into the weeds. We really want to focus on just getting more Black people elected to political office and having, you know, Ontario has over 300 agencies, boards, and commissions. Um, and I know that even when I was there, you know, we didn't have enough women, Indigenous, um, and people of color um, on those boards. And I think, you know, it doesn't take anything um, extra to have a Black person on your board. You're going you're gonna to have to put somebody on the board anyway. Do you have to put another white man? Like, does it have to be, right? <laughs> Try to find somebody else to put on the board. And I think, you know, they too need to go outside the bubble and start recruiting. Hey, Velma, uh, I'm guessing a lot of the people watching tonight probably don't know what a lot of the agencies, boards, and commissions, like I do, obviously. Oh, okay. But I'm thinking a lot of people probably don't know. And so can you maybe just give some examples and why it's so important to have diverse voices on those agency boards and commissions. Yeah. So, um, for, so, so all levels of government have agencies, boards and commissions. The provincial government is under the public appointment secretariat. And so each ministry will have, you know, at least two or three different boards that are under, under them. That, um, um, so it's a group of people that come together. They usually get a paid a per diem or sometimes the salary, depending on what it is. But they actually make um, policy on that particular area. So for instance, let's say it's, um, okay, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, Sports. So there would be, um, like Trillium is under Tourism, Culture, and Sports, and Trillium gives out tons of money to different organizations across Ontario. So it would be ideal to have a Black person or Indigenous person on that committee. So when they're doling out money to ensure that money is being given to, you know, uh, organizations in the Black community and the Indigenous community. Um, so each, each ministry will have their agencies that makes policies, dole out money, or, or advise the minister. So it's, it's, it's quite important, those, those, um, those agencies, boards, and commissions. And so it's equally important not only to have staffers, but to have people on those, those boards that are making the decisions represent Ontario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I'm curious, uh, so Operation Black Boat, how many, have you been able to recruit uh, a fair number of people to be on those agency boards and commissions? So we, we provide training. We can't, I mean, we can only tell people to apply, apply. Yeah. Um, right? Because um, then it goes into the database and they pull up, but we've been putting pressure on government to say, you know what, you have to make appointments. We want to make sure that you, um, are appointing black people to some of those appointments. And so we've been putting pressure on the, especially the federal government, but also the provincial government to do that mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I, it was one of the things that even be, prior to me becoming an MPP, I wasn't aware of just what an important role agency boards and commissions play yeah. and how many important decisions are, are made at those tables. And uh, they're almost hidden to the average voter. Yes, really. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I'm just wondering if how hopeful you feel that this moment and the conversation we're having uh, around systemic uh, um, racism, uh, if you think it will play a role in the next election and, and that there'll be more focus on, um, from political parties addressing systemic racism. Good. So I am hopeful that, you know, this moment won't get lost. Um, oftentimes, you know, once the cameras are gone, people just go back to normal. Um, but I think this is this time is a bit different. Um, I think there are people out there who won't allow it to go back to normal. We definitely will be making this an issue in the, in the next election. So it's not it's not going to go away. I think, you know, I've been getting tons of calls. Um, I have friends who getting calls, you know, just asking what can we do you know how can we how can we change how can we help so there is um an eagerness out there across the board for, for change to happen and you know people just want to know how to do it um and i say it's going to take a lot of hard work and i think government needs to also do that hard work i think government needs to look around and say hmm who's at at this table and who's not at this table you know let's look at our policy or you know through an anti-black lens um, does it 
does it does it pass? Does it not pass? Who's it uh, inadvertently affecting? And, and I think you need to you need to make individual change, and then I think individual change will be trickled down to systemic change. Yeah, and, and I would argue just everything you've said tonight. I think political parties, especially the Green Party, I'll only speak for our party. Like I think we need to look in the mirror and have a lot of self reflection too, and make sure that we have the right policies in place and the right people at the table making decisions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's funny, I did get um, a call from two of your riding presidents um, saying, what can we do? You know, uh, yeah. how, can, how can you help us? So there, there is, there is, there is a, a want or a need that people have that they need to change and then they need to just make things better for everybody. Yeah. Um, so that I'm, I'm hopeful for. And I, and I really truly hope that, you know, next year this time, you know, there's been change and that people are not thinking, oh, you remember what happened last year? You know, but they're actually changing they're, and, and you can see the change and feel the change. Mm -hmm. And do you think um, the COVID pandemic um, has any influence on that? Or is, I guess what I'm trying to think of is, there's a lot of talk about what the post COVID world is going to look like. Yeah. And, you know, can we emerge? I keep thinking, can we emerge out of this pandemic with one of the things is, you know, how do we create a more caring society? How do we break down systemic barriers? How do we, you know, address centuries of racism as we emerge from what, you know, some people have called this great pause that we're in right now. Yes. So, you know, this great pause gives us, you know, gives us room because it is going to be a new normal, right? Mm -hmm. And because we're having a new normal, what a, this is the, the best time to make that change, to mm -hmm. say we're having a new normal, we're going to have to pivot, we're going to have to change the way we do things, you know, incorporate anti-Black racism in your change, you know, mm -hmm. do things differently because you're going to have to do it differently, but do, do things differently. Um, and I think because it is COVID and because people have a lot of time to think and reflect and not the hustle and bustle of going to work, I think people, I've seen the video several times and people are, are reflecting on their lives and how they've contributed to, to anti-Black racism, whether it's subtly or, or, or not, and saying, what can I do? What more can I do to be an ally? What more can I do to change? And I think COVID allowed that to happen because we're all, we're all stuck at home. Right, so it gives us that time to reflect. Yeah, and I was gonna say it was, for me it was hopeful to see um, almost all the books about like learning about how to fight systemic racism yeah, yeah. or you know, white fragility yes. and those types of books were you know, all of a sudden are at the top of the bestseller list. Yes. And I look at Netflix as pivoted and there's all kinds of, you know, and other streaming services, uh, all kinds of movies, videos, shows yeah. about, you know, dismantling and, and addressing anti-Black racism. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm hoping that people actually have the time to read those books yes. right now yeah. Yeah. and watch those shows and, yeah. and we yeah. do emerge in some yeah. sort of new normal. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's great to watch those movies. It's great to read those books, but then we need the action. We need yeah. the work. Yeah. And the work, the work is not going to be done overnight. It, it takes constant work. And even when the work, you think the work is done, you still have to be vigilant that things don't go back to normal. Or go back to the way it was before, right? So you, the work is never ending. It's always, you know, checking your blind spot, checking that everything hasn't shifted in the wrong direction. So the work is a continuous work, and I think people, once you have that in your mind, that it's work, but it's continuous work. And so Velma, I have been so engaged in the conversation. I just realized I'm losing track of the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're, we're almost we're almost finished. So I think I've gone over our half hour a little okay. bit, but. I hope you'll uh, forgive me for that. I I, good. Um, good. I could keep talking to you for a long time. But <laughs> I'm good. I know we need to wrap up, and uh, and I know your time is incredibly valuable. And um, so I'm just wondering uh, two final questions, if you don't mind. So one is, uh, anybody who wants to be involved in Operation Black Boat, like, what's the pathway to being involved? Right. So the pathway to being involved is just signing up on our website, um, obvc.ca. Um, we do have a um, volunteer sheet. You sign up and it comes straight into our, um, into our office and then we'll contact you. Um, right now, there's really nothing 
um, that we have for you to do it because most of we've pivoted. I mean, we've doing workshops on Zoom calls. We're not having events where we usually use a lot of people. Um, so right now we're trying to figure out what are we gonna be doing between now and December? Um, so we'll have in the database, we'll reach out to you and say thank you, but um, there probably is not much to do right now. Okay. But you can still sign up. You can still sign up. You can still be on the list. And then yes. when things kick into gear, you'll be ready to go. Definitely, definitely. Okay, okay great. And then I was just wondering if you had any um, concluding remarks or just any insight or input that we haven't addressed during the conversation that you want to leave with everyone as some closing thoughts. Right. So I think, you know, acknowledging that anti-Black racism exists is the first step. Um, and then you know, going out and trying to educate yourself, trying to figure out where you're at on the spectrum. Um, I think that is that those are things that everybody should be doing. Um, having these Zoom calls and having calls with different members of the community just to get more insights on what needs to be done is um, is also a good a good start. So I think you know I am. Um, um, and that's why I'm so hopeful because so many people are reaching out. And as you said, they're on the top, they're on the top, you know, the top, the top 10 books. And there are tons of Zoom calls or tons of workshops that are happy that people are having. And so I think, you know, just continue to, to um, just reflect on what you can do in your personal space and the people around you. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can speak out, if you can hire a black person, if you can change policy, if you can um, promote a black person, um, those are all things that you know will help to eliminate anti-black racism and help to um, get rid of systemic racism. Um, and that's all I have for now. But you know, there's just there's just you know there's just so much to do that I, can't, I don't even have a list of different things. But those are some things that you can start with. So Velma, I just want to say uh, from the bottom of my heart how much I appreciate you taking the time to be a part of this conversation because you are such an incredibly busy person and, and I know there's a lot of demand for your time, especially right now. So I really appreciate you taking the time. And the other thing that means a lot to me is that you had the courage and were comfortable enough to challenge the Green Party because I think it's important for us to look in the mirror as well and to right. talk about how um, we diversify as a party and how the environmental movement diversifies as well right. uh, because we got to be a part of breaking down and addressing anti-black racism as well yeah and so yeah. thank you so much yeah. for for the advice you've given us tonight yeah. Uh, on a party level and on a societal level. Well, you know, thank you. I think you know, the Green Party has reached out to me at least three or four times. I mean, the Ontario, your, your office, you know, you invited me to come and speak at the, at your convention. We're doing this Zoom call. You came to our debate. So I think, you know, thank you for your leadership. I'm quite sure it has a lot to do with you and where you stand. You know, um, it come, everything comes from the top in terms of how, um, staff functions and I think I think your staff knows that this issue is very important to you and that's why I've, I've probably been so engaged with the Green Party Ontario Green Party because 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 they know that this is what you want to get done so we need more people like you who who wants to have that kind of change so thank you very much for in, in always inviting me and making me feel comfortable and reaching out to Operation Black Folk Canada. Well thank you and thanks everyone for joining in tonight on this important conversation and if you weren't able to catch it live, uh, we'll put it out on our social media uh, streams and uh, you can watch and, and listen later. So good night, everyone. Be well. I, I know we're moving into stage two and a lot of communities are starting to reopen now, but I really want to encourage everyone to continue to be safe and take care of everyone in, 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 in your circle and in our community. So thanks, everyone. Good night. And Velma, thanks again Thank for a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah, be well. You too.